Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Booth. I'm Gabby Sparks, joined today by Louis Scott Vargas, and we're heading into more rounds of Standard. We have one of your favorite decks. <laughs> it, it's the current front runner, yeah. Is it the front runner? Yeah, uh, this Teamer Colossus deck that uh, Oliver Pollock Rutman's playing is is very, very sweet. Uh, it's got a lot of really, like, cool lines of play. It's... Uh, it makes you cast a 10-10 for zero mana. Like, it, it's all stuff I like to do. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be seeing that pair off against blue-red spells. So let's head down to the match. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to coverage of Pro Tour Kaladesh. I'm Gabby Sparks, joined today by Luis Scott Vargas. And over on the left, we see Oliver Polak Rutman. He will be playing Team or Colossus today. Uh, both players are currently sitting at 9 and 3. He'll be facing off against uh, Pierre Dajan, uh, playing blue red spells. We got to see a little bit of this deck yesterday. Yeah, we saw uh, Pierre defeat uh, Raphael Levy in uh, uh, the blue red mirror match, though. Uh, I guess today is actually kind of also the blue red mirror match, though. This this Team or Colossus deck really is just an artifact deck. It, just, it happens to have random activated abilities of a bunch of different colors, but it, I wouldn't fully describe it as a Teamer deck in the traditional sense. Luis, can you give us a quick breakdown of what we can expect both of these uh, decks to bring to the table today? Well, both of these decks are extremely linear. They have a very focused game plan. Uh, Oliver Pollock rotmans deck is trying to play a bunch of artifacts mm -hmm. and make it so Metalwork Colossus costs zero mana. Once he's gotten it down to zero, maybe one or two mana, he can play it, trigger Sanctum Ugin, which he actually has in play right now, mm -hmm. sacrifice the Sanctum and get another Colossus and dump two to three Colossus uh, into play on the same time. There's also one Elder Deep Fiend to search for with Sanctum Ugin, so he sometimes will have the line of Colossus, Colossus, Elder Deep Fiend on your opponent on up. Mm -hmm. On the other side, uh, Pierre Dagen is playing a Blue Red Spells deck, which really is powered by Dynavolt Tower. And that uh, generates a bunch of energy, two energy every time uh, Pierre plays a spell, and then he can spend five energy to deal three damage to a creature or player. It serves as both his win condition uh, and a way to keep creatures off the board. So it looks like both players are off to a pretty good start, both uh, making all their land drops, also having all the colors that they want, and it looks like uh, that is going to get countered with Void Shatter. No Cultivator's Caravan for Oliver. Cultivator's Caravan and uh, the uh, Sky Sovereign console flagship are both pretty integral parts of this Colossus deck because they don't count as creatures mm -hmm. until they're crewed, so they review, they, they reduce the cost of Colossus, and then later you can crew them with Colossus or, or sometimes uh, Glint Nest Crane. Hedra and Archive coming down for Oliver. This is also very good at contributing because it'll contribute not just for, for being an artifact, but also too when it manages to tap. So if we are able to see that he has a Metalwork Colossus already, so uh, it looks like this Colossus might be coming down soon. Yeah, currently the Colossus cost is uh, five. There's a four mana artifact and a two mana artifact in play. So it had that caravan uh, resolved, then Colossus would have come down this turn. Oliver can actually cast the Colossus right now. You really do want to get it down a little bit cheaper. Uh, you, you may also notice a flip card in his hand. He's got, Oliver has a Handweir Battlements, which can give Colossus haste here. <laughs> One of the strengths of this Colossus deck is the land. Sanctum of Ugin and Inventor's Fair are both uh, very, very important to the deck, and you, you see them both in play right now. And it looks like here is Colossus number one coming down. That triggers the Sanctum, and Oliver is opting to sacrifice it, searching up another Metalwork Colossus there. You see it on the right. One of the new additions from Kaladesh. And one of the one of the really cool parts about Metalwork Colossus is that if Pierre were to deal with it, then Oliver could sacrifice two artifacts to bring it back. Uh, of course, Void Shatter exile effects do deal with it permanently, but oh man, here, here's that battlements coming into play. <laughs> and Col Colossus getting in there so quickly for ten. So Oliver has he's a, he played a ten ten, given it haste, hit Pierre down to ten, and you know Pierre is playing a blue red deck that generally kills creatures by dealing damage. I mean, the red spells all deal damage, so he's in the unenviable position of maybe having to double Lightning Axe to kill Colossus, and then he's going to face down another Colossus powered by Hanwear Battlements. Yeah, it looks like it might be combinations of things like Fiery Tempers or Lightning Axes. And uh, an update from one of our back tables, it looks like Zach Elsick, who's playing Jeskai Control, uh, is up a game versus Ben Hull, who's playing Red White Vehicles. Oh, that was a quick game for just very, very quick. To Especially win. this is this is a very quick game already. <laughs> Metalwork Colossus number two coming down. Another Sanctum of Ugin is being sacrificed. Tutoring. We will see momentarily. 
<laughs> Middle of Colossus number three. All right, the, the Colossus Factory is working overtime here as uh, Oliver is just running 10 10 after 10 10 uh, into Pierre's blue red deck. And, and you know, we saw a similar thing last time we saw Pierre. He, he played against a linear deck. It happened to be Raph Levy's uh, graveyard based prized amalgam deck. And game one, just not very well set up to close out the game before the other deck does or deal with the threats presented. In this case, it's 10-10s before it was recursive creatures. And yeah, it looks like the players are going to go to game two. Yeah, those Colossi, those Colossi managed to get in there, thanks to Haste, too, and uh, attacking for it more than lethal this game. It looks like he manages to take the first game. We have a lot more magic coming your way, but first, these messages. Put your game to the test at a Grand Prix. These Magic celebrations are headlined by two-day open tournaments with the best players in your region as well as top Magic pros from around the world. Find an upcoming Grand Prix near you at magic.wizards.com slash Grand Prix. Support your local game store by going to Friday Night Magic. Have fun hanging out with friends, cracking new Magic packs, and playing with your favorite Kaladesh cards. Featuring devious gremlins, ingenious dwarves, and face-smashing gearhulks. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to coverage of Pro Tour Kaladesh. We're going to be taking a look at uh, Benjamin White, who's playing a white colorless mid-range versus Carlos uh, Romao, who's playing Jessica Control. Um, players are currently 9-3 and three is uh, Ben White, and uh, Carlos is currently sitting at 8-3-1. And uh, Carlos looking pretty good this game. So Ben White's deck is, uh, as he actually just described in the interview again with Marshall, kind of Junda-like, which is to say mid-range, not particularly fast with a lot of removal, even though it happens to be mono white. And you, you see a Thought Knot here, there, Stasis near Declaration of Stone. These are the kind of cards Ben's trying to leverage. Unfortunately, decks like that tend not to have great matchups against the really long game control decks, which is what Carlos is playing. He's playing a Torrential Gear Hulk fueled Just Guy control deck that's just got a ton of removal, counter spells, Torrential Gear Hulks, and Planeswalkers. So you, you see, Carlos is kind of working Ben over with that Torrential Gear Hulk, Gear Hulk plus uh, Dovin Bond. What do you think of a metagame call of a mid-range deck like this versus all the linear decks that we've seen in the feature match, and, and just generally at this uh, Pro Tour? This this mono white deck does does look does this mono white deck does look like it's pretty well set up against the slightly lower curve decks. It's uh, it's not exactly the deck I would want to take in against something like a Colossus deck, though. It, it it's got a lot of exile effects, so. It's mm -hmm. kind of hard to say because the, the mono white deck has so many unconditional answers like Stasis Snare, Declaration of Stone, Thought Not Seer. On the other hand, it's just not that powerful of a deck. The mono white deck is is playing a lot of very fair magic. So against mm -hmm. unfair decks, sometimes that's just not going to line up well. On the other hand, what is a deck like uh, Carlos's? What is it trying to accomplish in this matchup? In, in this particular matchup, Carlos can, you know, be pretty content in the fact that he's going he's. He's going to win the long game here because he's got Archangel Avacyn, he's got Torrential Gear Hulk, he's got uh, you know four copies of Glimmer of Genius, draw, draw, scry two and then draw two. So I, I think Carlos is in pretty good shape here. D ben is just not going to be able to close out the game before Carlos's more powerful cards come out to play, and that's that's part of the problem with something like this uh, mono white mid range deck. Even if you know cards like Thought Not Seer are just fantastic cards. Torrential Gear Hulk just goes over the top. Yeah, and it looks like uh, Carl's attacking here with both Archangel Avacyn and Torrential Gear Hulk coming in for quite a bit of damage. Avacyn goes down, and so do those spirits. This drops Ben down to five. I, I, I would like to see a Dovin Bond ultimate, but uh, I, I suspect that, that we're not very close to seeing that because <laughs> Car Carlos is happy enough just uh, getting incremental value over and over again. Also notice that Carlos just has ten lands in play and... Uh, ben has five. So, and Carlos doesn't does not seem like he's in danger of missing a land drop, which is, despite not having something like Sphinx's Revelation, just a good place to be. Carlos is sitting on double immolating glare, double fumigate, and void shatter. So he's got answers to pretty much anything Ben could play. And because this is still game one, Ben has a lot of creature rule in his deck, which he will want to remove post sideboard. Does look like there's also that uh, wandering fumarole sne <laughs> sitting sneakily over on the right and getting ready to battle. Archangel Avison coming in for Ben. It's gonna meet a void shatter. Yeah, I don't think Archangel's along for this world. She would have been good if she resolved. Thought not Sierra forced to get in front of that uh, wandering fumarole, but that's gonna do it. Carlos takes this first game. 
we will be bringing you updates of what's going on in that match. But for now, we are moving back to uh, Oliver Pollock Rockman versus uh, Pierre Dajan. So the last time we saw Pierre play, he was able to de defeat Raphael Levy by siding in four copies of Nibbles of Frost and mm -hmm. four copies of Thing in the Ice. And I would expect kind of a similar transformation here. I mean, w we'll see because I, I haven't played the, the Colossus yeah, matchup with <laughs> the Blue Red Dynavolt Tower deck. But uh, Nibbles of Frost really impressed me earlier. And it is a way to deal with Metalwork Colossus. If you look at Pierre's main deck, he doesn't really have a great way to stop the Colossus. He can Void Shatter it. That's a good answer. But mm -hmm. cards like Galvanic Bombardment, Fiery Temper, Lightning Axe, they do not match up well against 10 tons. On the other hand, what do you think is happening for the other deck post-board? Uh, post-board... Oliver does get to bring in a couple cards. Thought Not Seer is generally good against uh, controlling type decks. Other than that, maybe a Metal Spinner's Puzzle Knot <laughs> as an extra <laughs> card draw spell. That's a little thin, but I mean, he's got a Metal Spinner's Puzzle Knot on the side, but I cannot imagine that that is for anything but control matchups. And if he, if he knows about Pierre's sideboard plan, which at this stage in the tournament, I wouldn't be surprised if he did, Confiscation Coup could be an answer for a Niblis of Frost. All right, and taking a look at the player's hand, it looks like uh, those Thought Knots here have come in for uh, Pola Grotman, by the way. It's going to kick us off with a Neither Hub. A few Marvel for Pierre. And aha, Metal Spinner's Puzzle Knot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we did it. Uh, <laughs> it. Despite it being the Black Puzzle Knot and Oliver presumably being Teamer, he's got four copies of either Hub. He's got Cultivator's Caravan and Prophetic Prism. So if he wants, he can spin some metal. And spin some metal he will. The first one coming down, lose one life, draw a card. I also like that uh, Teamer deck plays Sylvan Scrying. Just, it's more copies of Sanctum of Ugin. So this deck's very good at assembling Sanctum of Ugin and you know, going Colossus into Double mm -hmm. Sanctum, get more Colossi, and just really overpowering the opponent. I also got word from Tim Willoughby, our uh, sideline reporter. Uh, Reed Duke is up a game versus Kenji Samura. Uh, Reed is playing uh, red-white vehicles, and Kenji is in black-green delirium. Yeah, and we, we briefly saw both of these players in the feature match. Uh, we saw Reed defeat Carlos Romao yesterday, and then we saw Kenji actually lose to Eric Froelich in the Black Green Delirium Mirror match. So it'll be interesting to see if we can catch any of their game. Sylvan's crying, uh, getting a land here for Oliver. And either hub uh, powering out Sylvan's crying to get the Sanctum to then play a Colossus, to then sack the Sanctum to get another Colossus. And yeah, Sylvan's crying seems great in this deck. It's just basically another way to continue getting card advantage. Because you need the first Colossus, but... Other than that, it seems very good. Yeah, basically at the time you play Colossus, sacking the Sanctum to get another Colossus is, I, I would characterize it as card advantage because even though you're trading one for one, mm -hmm. you're trading a land that no longer uh, an is as useful for a 10 For an 11 drop? Yeah. <laughs> Anticipate for Pierre. Quick look at uh, Pierre's hand. It looks like there's a, there's a Nimbleus of Frost coming in there. Ceremonious Rejection, Hardness, Lightning, Void Shatter, and Void Shatter. So those Ceremonious Rejections seems like they could do good work against Oliver as well. Ceremonious Rejection is an impressive sideboard card. One of the reasons to play blue in this format is that you get to play four copies of Ceremonious Rejection. And, you know, I, I, I see that Oliver has four in his sideboard and Pierre has two to go along with all those Void Shatters. So Counterspells looking pretty good. They haven't looked that great in Standard for a while, but Counterspells looking good right now. All right, so Hedron Archive is currently on the stack. And this is one of the best cards in, in the Colossus deck for enabling Colossus. It, it's net plus two the turn you play it, net plus six when it's in play. So mm -hmm. I'm not surprised that Pierre does not want that to resolve. That Void Shatter says a no to the Hedron Archive, and we're going to see a pass back to Pierre. See what his follow-up will be. The Nibbles of Frost, and uh, yeah, it's time to read it. This card, oh, we saw it do great work in multiple matches yesterday. Yeah, Nibbles of Frost is the exact kind of uh, transformational sideboard you want, because... It's a creature, but it can very easily kill or dominate the game by itself. It's a 4-4 four, four to 5-5 five, five attacker because of prowess. And Pierre's deck is so full of spells that I could see Nibbles of Frost beating two Colossi in play quite easily. Thought Nuts here coming a little bit too late to actually nab that Nibbles of Frost. And uh, Pierre determining whether he can use a ceremonious rejection on that card, which he, he, he certainly can if he would like to. And it looks like he decides he does not want to deal with the Thought Knots here. Ceremonious Rejection will take care of it, and we're going to see a pass back to Pierre. 
Funnily enough, it looks like Oliver also boarded in Ceremonies Rejection, presumably to stop Dynavolt Tower, though it can counter Void Chatter, because Void Chatter is devoid, and uh, th that's just like one of those interesting interactions of cere with Ceremonies Rejection against uh, cards from the previous block. And am I hearing also that uh, Zach Elzik versus Ben Hall, they have actually evened it out, so they are going to a game three. Determined not to get on camera, just racing to finish that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this isn't a set with a bunch of vehicles to not race, okay? <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> Oliver playing one of the most powerful cards in the format. Glutinous Crane is... It's funny because it's it's kind of an integral piece of multiple different decks. The Colossus deck and the Aetherworks Marvel deck is just very good in both decks. It's better than the Colossus deck. The deck has more artifacts, but it's still quite good in both. And Glintness Crane is has really earned its keep here. And uh, here we see Glimmer of Genius. And the trigger on Nimbalosa Frost is going to tap down that crane. That one's not necessarily the one he wants to tap, but it is nice having it out of the way. Get a little free value there, yes. Even though uh, Colossus is really who Nibbles for Frost is there, it might as well ice down the crane while it's at it. Wonder and Fumeral also uh, a somewhat important card in, in Pierre's deck because in, uh, in, a, in a win condition light deck with a bunch of counters, getting to crack in for four damage here and there does really add up. And the Nibble is continuing to chip in. Just a couple of Hardness Lightnings and Negate and the Void Shatter in, hand, in uh, hand for Dajin. So we'll have ways to deal with that Colossus if it does come down, but not under a lot of pressure here. Hardness Lightning, one of the weakest cards post-board for, for Pierre. He unfortunately has drawn multiple copies of it. But it, it, it could eventually take down a Crane. It could take down a Thought Knots here if, if another one of those were to resolve. Yeah, and Pierre continues to deny Oliver uh, the effective mana, and in the case of Hedron Archive, actual mana. It's going to meet in the gates. Nivellus is going to continue tapping down that, uh, that crane. Yeah, and I think it's a good distinction to draw, like you just said, between effective and actual mana. Like, mm -hmm. every artifact in play is, it does essentially tap for mana equal to its casting cost to cast Colossus. Hedron Archive also tapping for an additional two. Mm -hmm. And you see right now, Oliver has Sanctum of Ugin play. He's got Colossus in hand, but he's not able to drop, you know, the, do the multiple Colossus turns as easily as, as he would like to. If he had a Hedron Archive in play, he could play two Colossi in the same turn. He could even sack Inventor's Fair and maybe play a third. But because Pierre has been aggressively countering Hedron Archive, the Colossus still costs five mana, which that, that's a pretty good deal for a 10-10, but it's not play two for free good. Pierre is down to just one counter spell now. He started out with, a, with how many? He had like three in hand? Yeah, so far he's cast Void Shatter, Ceremonies, Rejection, Negate, and he still has another Void Shatter in hand, but... The disadvantage of this whole plan is that he's not able to counter multiple copies of Colossus now mm -hmm. because he did use those counters on the Hedron Archives, though I think that did work out better for him. So the Sanctum of Ugin now is being sacrificed after the first Colossus comes down. There you see Colossus on the right. That goes in hand. And the interaction between Sanctum of Ugin and Metal Colossus is really what drives this deck. And then Do you think this deck could exist without uh, Sanctum of Ugin or Inventor's Fair? I think that it could survive without Inventor's Fair, though the Fair does do some good work. I don't think it could exist without Sanctum of Ugin. I just think that it, its plan of just go all in on one Colossus is, would be too risky, but having the, having the Sanctums to get a second Colossus is just such a big upgrade. Mm -hmm. All right, so Hardness Lightning... Targeting the Glintness Crane, but the Nibbles of Frost Trigger yep. taps down the Metalwork Colossus. Okay. What do you think about the fact that he chose not to counter that first Colossus? I, it makes sense because Pierre has identified Nibbles of Frost as a card that can just deal with Colossus while it's in play. Mm -hmm. it, Dealing with two given his hand would be difficult, so I think he may try to void chatter the second one. As it turns out, Oliver has that ceremonious rejection in hand, so regardless of when he tried to cast void chatter, it wouldn't work out that well. But one one thing that Pierre gains by waiting like this, now that void chatter is going to trigger Nibbles of Frost. So mm -hmm. even if void chatter gets countered, he gets a Nibbles trigger off of it and taps down the first Colossus for an additional turn. So that, that's an additional bit of value. 
Yeah, so the exact same thing you were talking about is playing out right here, and the, the Ceremonious Rejection will counter this Void Shatter, but it is going to trigger the yeah. Nimbleus of Frost. This still triggers. And yep. their yes. players are sorting out which wood is getting tapped. So Oliver does end up with two Colossi in play, which uh, is going to put Pierre under some pressure, but if Pierre can just draw a couple spells in a row, the Nimbleus of Frost may be able to manage this. He really needs Glimmer of Genius, though. Glimmer of Genius between the Scry 2 and the Draw 2 gives him access to enough spells to maybe carry over to finish line. W one thing that's being re very relevant right here is Wood Weaver's Puzzle Knot. The fact that it gained three when it came to play and soon will gain Oliver another three life means that he might be able to outlast Nibblus of Frost and be able to uh, use those two Colossi mm -hmm. to, to reduce Pierre's life total to zero. Dynavolt Tower coming down for Pierre, but it's going to meet a Ceremonious Rejection. Wow, so Oliver found two of them, and they both did some good work here. Maybe you see the power of bringing in a card like this post-board. Yeah, I thought I thought that Pierre would get a lot more mileage out of Ceremonious Rejection, but they've been looking pretty good on Oliver's yeah, side. Yeah, they definitely have. Yeah, One of the claws, <laughs> yeah, so the first claws is still tapped down, and uh, it looks like uh, Dajan does have a couple ways of interacting. He still has a Harness Lightning in hand, so he will be able to continue tapping it down, but he's running out of time. He is, and he's going to run out of life, too. The, the Colossus chunks in for 10 every time it hits. That Inventor's Fair also just ticking up. It's gaining Oliver one life every upkeep. At some point, he can sacrifice it to get another Colossus. I would be interested to know whether Oliver sided out Sky Sovereign console flagship, mm -hmm. because that could be a potential way to threaten Niblis, even though the, the three damage from the flagship is defeated by a prowess trigger. So it looks like the Hardness Lightning is going to be cast, and it is going to tap down the Colossus. So no damage coming through this turn, at right. least. Yes. <laughs> that Cultivator's Caravan that Oliver just added is also quite relevant, because if Pierre tries to tap down a Colossus during Oliver's beginning of combat, he can use that Colossus to crew the Caravan and just get an extra attacker in. So I think that the Colossus is going to you know, inexorably march towards Pierre's life total, and he's going to have a hard time stopping it. Oh, take inventory. <laughs> Gonna continue tapping down that Colossus and draw one card. What did you find? The Bulls of Frost continuing to get in. Well, it's a good sign for Pierre. He did not attack with the... Uh, Another Nibulus of Frost. All right, well, see, now we're talking, because now any spell Pierre draws buys him a whole turn of Colossus attacks. So, and he also doubled his clock. So I think that is one of the best draws Pierre could have found and he might be in good shape. The question is, if Oliver has a Sky Sovereign left in his deck, he does get to pick off one of those Nibluses. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's the correct pluralization. To be fair, we were learning a lot about pluralization of, uh, of multiple magic cards yesterday. Well, co apparently Colossus, you could say Colossuses or Colossi. Yeah, it depends on... Th they're both technically correct. Or Colossuses. Is, 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 is. is that how you like to say it? <laughs> is that technically correct? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not technically correct, which is, as we all know, the best type of correct? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Pierre is hellbent, though, uh, meaning he has no cards in hand right now, so he does need to top something good. And Oliver did not search for a Sky Sovereign, so I, I assume that he may have boarded them out. He did get another Colossus, though. I was going to say, did you see what he drew? And he, he, he drew the Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot, which gives him another three life, actually six life once he gets around to cracking it. It, all, it makes Colossus cheaper, so now he's going to have three Colossi on the board, which is, well, that's a lot of Colossuses. <laughs> Colossus number three. We've yet to see four Colossus out on the board at the same time, but this game, it might be it. And then looks like the, yeah, it looks like the caravan is getting crewed with the first Colossus, or the untapped Colossus, rather. Oliver with a casual 30 power, 30 toughness, plus a caravan <laughs> that can be activated at any time. Pierre fighting the good fight with two Nibblus of Frost. If he can draw a Glimmer of Genius or take inventory or anticipate and string multiple spells together, Pierre could still get out of this. Nibblus of Frost is an incredibly powerful card. All right, so the big draw step. Let's see uh, what he manages to find. Looks like it's a Dynavolt Tower. Well, that will trigger Prowess, but it doesn't actually trigger the tap ability of Nibblus of Frost. Uh, Wandering Fumarole may be jumping in front of uh, Colossus First at some course. point today. <laughs> <laughs> and they say exactly that prowess trigger. Yeah.
So, what Woodbridge pulls up puts Oliver to 11. That's 8, wait, 8, 12, 15 off the Dynavolt Tower. So, Oliver can go to 14, but actually, the Dynavolt Tower essentially dealt 5 damage this turn. <laughs> so, I, I think Pierre may have just stolen this game. Oh my god! You guys are counting the prowess triggers and the Dynavolt Tower. Wow. <laughs> Pierre, Pierre knows he got away with something there. <laughs> yeah, did you see? He, has this, <laughs> he breathes a sigh of relief. Wow. It looked like he might have been out of that game, but he's going to push it onto a game three. <laughs> that was a crazy match. In the meantime, we are going to take a peek and see uh, Reed Duke versus Kenji Samura. So Reed is currently sitting at nine and three, and he is playing red white vehicles. Uh, Kenji on the other side is playing black green delirium, also sitting at nine and three. And of note, Kenji is playing a slightly more aggressive version of the Delirium deck. He's got a Smuggler's Copter and, you know, four copies of Virgil's Gear Hulk. So th this could be a, a race, and uh, Reed's deck is pretty well equipped for races. Ooh, is he one of the, the rare sightings of Chandra Torch of Defiance in play uh, out of the, the sideboard for Reed? Uh, very good card when you're both playing a bunch of, you know, two to four mana creatures. Mm -hmm. and. You know, who knows what Chandra ate this game, but I, I think she may have taken out a creature <laughs> earlier. Do you think this is a kind of shell that wants Chandra wants to be in? But I mean, at best, she's what a sideboard card for Reed. It, it's a sort of Chandra is, and this is almost exactly what I said when I first saw the card. Uh, she's an incredibly powerful card. She just needs the r the right meta game, and Smuggler's Copter is not exactly the kind of card you want to to battle with Chandra. Right now, you actually see the, the, the Smuggler's Copter, I think, attacking Chandra directly. Mm -hmm. It was about to get ambushed by an Avacyn, but a Grasp of Darkness is going to prevent that. Kenji gets to loot and uh, discards a Grim Flare. So read on just double Thraven Inspector plus a clue. Though, if that clue yields something, then Reed could be back in it. Fleet Wheel, Cruiser, Gideon, these are the kind of cards Reed wants. He just wants high impact cards now. Once you get up to six mana with the red-white vehicles deck, you really don't want to draw your one-drops anymore. Mm -hmm. And Reed's in a position where he, he may be a, a little heavy on them. So Reed plays a Smuggler's Copter, leaves back uh, that one Thraven Inspector so he can potentially animate that uh, Copter if he wants to. Okay. So Khalid is coming down for Kenji. And uh, Kalitas jumps the into the <laughs> Get in the choppa. And uh, Delirium is online, by the way, for Kenji. So uh, that um, Dryad is coming in for three. And another one coming down as well. And and despite Reed leaving back Smuggler's Copter to block, because of Kalitas, I believe he chose not to. Because if he trades there, then Kenji ends up getting a, a zombie. So now Kenji has basically three three threes plus Kalitas. So Reed's in a, a somewhat tough spot because if any sort of creature combat happens, Kalidas just starts stacking up those zombies. So let's see what uh, Reed can manage for this turn. It seems like he's found a Dapala. And Dapala will be able to crew that copter, potentially finding him more dwarves or vehicles. Dapala, pretty good draw for Reed. Not only does she make Smuggler's Copter a 4-4, which goes over the top of Kenji's Smuggler's Copter. I, I guess going over the top makes sense. They're both flying. Uh, <laughs> she also gets to trigger for four because Reed, Reed can pay, pay four mana and take a look at the top four cards of his deck, see if he can pick up any dwarves and or vehicles. Yeah, and Kenji's opting to attack with both Death Touch creatures. Uh, Death Touch creatures obviously have no fear here in the face of Dipala, but let's see what uh, Reed is able to find once he crews that. And it's a miss. Yeah, and, and Reed, uh, once again, just doesn't want to block Narwa Dryad because of Kalitas, so Reed's just taking six damage over and over again. All right, a veteran motor is coming down for Reed. He gets to scry, too. Yeah, I never really thought about it before, but the, the combo of scrying plus Dipala, yeah, that, that actually is a little bit of dwarf synergy there. <laughs> <laughs> veteran motor sets up the top of your deck for Dipala. And then you can decide whether you want to draw it or not. Yeah, that is that is pretty cool. And it's kind of a, a feature of this red-white vehicles deck is that, yes, this is a very aggressive deck. We've seen Reed, you know, string together turn four or five kills. But he also has multiple sources of card advantage here between Smuggler's Copter, Dipala, and Veteran Motorist. So, he, yes, he exactly left those two. Left a Smuggler's Copter and a Toolcraft Exemplar, yes. And he gets to draw both of them as well. Yeah, it was very efficient. Reed spent two mana to draw two cards, attacks with Smuggler's Copter, gets to loot, and now gets to play two, two more cards this turn. Kalitas is still presenting Reed with a really big problem, though. Yeah, and he also gets to discard that exemplar. Cool. Smuggler's Copter coming down as well. 
And this has been a great comeback for you. It was looking uh, pretty. It was looking pretty grim with just the two mere Thraven inspectors. But here we've seen how uh, powerful Depala has been. Yeah, she's stacked up a lot of cards for Rita. I still think that that Kalidas will, will end up being problematic. But Narwa Dryad, you know, Reed could block one of them, fall to three, and then maybe try to attack in the air with it for enough damage to to outrace whatever zombie tokens that Kalitas might make. All right, so it looks like this veteran motorist might be jumping in front of the Narwhal Dryad. Also worth noting, we saw a Sky Wheeler shot put on the bottom from Depala, so Reed does have answers for Kalitas. And then Declaration in Stone is another very effective card if Reed can find one of those. And here we see what you were talking about. Kalitas goes, humph, there's a zombie. I think this game might be concluding soon, so I want to stick around and see just the very end of it. Yeah, we'll, we'll head back to uh, our, our third, third game against uh, with Oliver against Pierre in a second here. But with Reed at three life, this, we're, we're going to see if those smugglers, copters, and DePaulo can pull Reed out this last couple uh, turns here. Since he's, he's in a precarious position, because right now, Kenji has three lethal creatures plus a smuggler's copter, which he can crew with a zombie. So essentially four lethal creatures. Also, if any of Reed's creatures dies... Uh, Kenji gets a zombie token. So Reed has a kind of precarious balance here where he, he wants to stay alive, so he has to do some blocking. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't block the correct creatures or if he blocks with, with creatures that are too small, he'll end up increasing the size of Kenji's forces. While this is all going on, Reed also has to start attacking Kenji's life total or Reed's just going to lose a long game. So it's a tough way to get out of this, but uh, Reed does have a couple sources of card advantage and a couple ways to find removal, because if Reed were able to remove Kalitas from the board, then all this would get much, much simpler. All right, so it looks like the Thraven Inspector getting into the Smuggler's Copter. Copter's going to attack. Going to see some looting. D and do you think, uh, why do you think Reed chose to attack with the foil smuggler's copter versus the normal one? Probably to send a message, I think. Yeah. D do you think Kenji received that message? I, th I think so. <laughs> See, he's taking the damage. Yeah. Loud and clear. <laughs> Ooh, and Gideon. This is what you were talking about earlier, Luis. This is a very high impact card, especially uh, being able to block, you know, all the ground creatures that Kenji has currently. And then uh, worth noting that the knight token also won't trigger Kalitas because it's, it is a token. So that, that does give Reed a, kind of like a free chump blocker. It's actually an Owen. Oh, <laughs> it's a token now. All right. Yes. All right, so Kenji deciding what he wants to do. We've, we've seen a couple of appearances of Owen in the feature match area, but uh, he was, you know, as with this one, quickly removed from the table. <laughs> He actually won his last match the last time we saw him, but... And a quick update from one of our back tables. Uh, ben Hall wins the match between him and Zach Gelsick. That puts... Uh, this is Ben's first Pro Tour appearance, actually, and he is moving on to 10-3, uh, and three, so congratulations to him. A great record. And speaking of moving on, Kenji has moved into the red zone. He's a... Uh, Slamming with Smuggler's Copter, Kalitas, uh, Sylvan Advocate, which is a 4-5, and a 3-3 Narwhal Dryad. Also, something I'd be very worried about if I were Reed. Is he discarded a Grasp of Darkness? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Smuggler's Copter drew Genji card, and he chose to discard Grasp of Darkness, which seems like a highly relevant card right now. So whatever the last card is in Kenji's hand, it's likely a very good one. I would say most likely just another removal spell, but either way, that does give Reed some pretty good information. All right, so Depaul is going to get into the, into the Smuggler's Copter. He's also going to activate for one. Let's see. It is a whiff. Planes to the bottom. All right. So it is murder. You were completely correct about that. It is another removal spell. And that looks like that does not leave Reed enough blocks to survive. Yep. And that's going to be the game. Yeah, this is going to be moving to a game three. But in the meantime, we are going to be moving back to our main match. Uh, this is uh, Oliver Polak Rotman versus da Pierre Dajan. And we saw Pierre sneak out a win with some uh, Niblesses of Frost last <laughs> game. Uh, it, it was a valiant battle. It was, it was three copies of Metalwork Colossus against two copies of Niblis of Frost. And we'll, we'll see if we, how these, these two decks line up this game. You know, had Oliver had a Sky Sovereign in his deck to tutor for with Inventor's Fair last mm -hmm. game, he would have been able to kill one of the, the copies of Niblis. So it's interesting to see if he leaves one of those in his deck this, this round because... 
he he may have sideboarded all the copies out, not knowing what Pierre's sideboard plan was. Mm -hmm. But now that he's seen Nibbles of Frost and actually saw how effective it was, I wouldn't be surprised if Sky Sovereign was in the deck. Looks like uh, Ben Whites versus Carlos Romo is also going to a game three. That's Sylvan Scrying tutoring that Inventor's Fair for Oliver. I just wanted the name to write down. The funny thing is, it, that is actually pretty fair. Inventor's Fair costing four mana to use, I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe as broken. It's just, it's just good and fair. Whereas Sanctum of Ugin costing zero to use, that is like somewhat unfair. What do you think about the fact that he tutored a fair? Does this just indicate that he has a couple of Sanctums in hand? Yeah, I would not expect him to tutor up Inventor's Fair unless he already had at least one copy of Sanctum, maybe two. I mean, it depends on what his plan is here, but that is uh, th the card that you want after Sanctum, so I, w I wouldn't be surprised if he, he already had a Sanctum. A Deadlock Trap comes down for Oliver and a Dynamo Tower for Pierre. We're going to see a pass back to Oliver now. Another reason for Oliver to tutor for Inventor's Fair, if he's going to play a couple artifacts over the next couple turns and he wants to start building up a cushion of life, mm -hmm. that, that could make sense as well. Okay, so it looks like Cultivator Caravan coming down two more for the Puzzle Nut. This is going to gain him three life and also going to gain him three energy. Deadlock Trap, another card that may have fluctuated between main and board for Oliver, but it does keep uh, Nimbus of Frost from chipping away at Oliver's life total. Uh oh. Oh, Dynamo Tower number two. So, Dynamo Tower stacks really, really well. Uh, a little better than Etherworks Marvel, because first of all, it's not legendary. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, because if Pierre, every time Pierre casts a spell, he's now going to get four energy, and he's going to have two great ways to, to utilize that energy with Dynamo Towers. So, Oliver is under some pressure to, to start playing a, you know, his never-ending stream of Metalwork Colossi. And it does look like he has the first one, at least, in hand already. Coupled with a Ceremonious Rejection and a Confiscation Coup. All right, well, I like Confiscation Coup, that it can steal Nimbus of Frost, but, you know, worth noting, it can also steal Dynavolt Tower. We could see Tower switching sides, and uh, it'll be interesting to see <laughs> what Oliver can do with the Dynavolt Tower if he chooses to use Confiscation Coup. All right, so the first Colossus coming down. No Sanctum to crack this time. It is going to meet that Ceremonious Rejection. Poor Colossus, he just wanted to come out and yeah. play. <laughs> he just wanted to be friends, but uh, Pierre, Pierre wanted... He wanted. He, first of all, he got rejected. Second of all, that, that actually double-triggered Dynavolt Tower, so now Pierre has four energy. With, with two Dynavolt Towers in play, Pierre has a good amount of inevitability, so he's going to want to sit there and just be reactive, whereas when there was a Colossus in play, he had to be proactive and start attacking with Nibbles of Frost. Taking a look at uh, Dajin's hand, we see that there's a Nibbles of Frost, a Negate, a Take Inventory, Void Shatter, and Glimmer of Genius. So a lot of card draw, a lot of counter spells, and the Nibbles, which we saw be absolutely crucial in the last game. And one of the reasons Pierre may not have wanted to tap out for Nibbles last turn is that he just didn't really need to. He's got the two Dynavolt Towers out. He, he's not even facing down a Colossus, so it's not as big of a threat as it would be otherwise. So he, he's able to just sit back on those Dynavolt Towers. And now the, the decision Pierre has is he's got two copies of Glimmer of Genius. He really wants to cast one this turn. So despite aggressively countering uh, Hedron Archive last turn, he's got a much tougher decision now. It looks like he's heavily considering countering that. And he is going to go for it. What do you make of this decision? It's really close. Because you really want to use Negate on a turn where you have, you know, two mana up instead of four mana up. Because Pierre essentially spent four mana on that Negate. He wasn't able to cast his four mana spell. He didn't mm -hmm. do anything with the other two mana. On the other hand, he's worried about getting hit by a double Colossus turn. And he knows if he counters that Hedron Archive, it just makes further Colossi much more expensive. Notice that uh, Pierre started to shoot with the tower. When, when your opponent shoots you from 25 to 22 with Dynavolt Tower, <laughs> usually not a great sign. All right, so the first take inventory is going to provide some energy and also draw two cards since there is already one in the graveyard. And one thing that, that Pierre is vulnerable to here is he's left up Void Shatter. He has three men up, he has a Void Shatter, and... Oliver does have a Ceremonious Rejection in hand, so that, that's kind of his trump in that particular counter war. Because Void Shatter is devoid, you know, it is a colorless card, and Ceremonious Rejection can counter it. So 
Oliver still with that uh, confiscation coon ceremonious rejection in hand. Looks like he's going to go for five. <laughs> One thing that is, has and just come the, Yeah, there it is. Confiscation coup. It's going to immediately meet a void shatter, triggering both those towers once more. And a response. Ceremonious rejection. This is also using my trigger, so I've 11 energies. All right, so he continues to get energy from this. And, and Pierre not deciding whether he wants to shoot with the void shot, uh, the uh, Dynavolt tower that's getting stolen here. He's got a lot of energy. I suspect he's going to want to. Is the one you target? Yeah, and he's confirming, saying this is the one you're targeting. He says, sure, I'm going to shoot you. And here you can have it. So I gain one energy. Yeah. So Oliver goes up to nine energy, then spends three of that energy, go down to six energy to, to confiscate the Dynavolt tower. Which is funny, because Oliver can actually use it. He, 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 he can probably get two good shots off this game, depending on uh, how many Woodweaver's Puzzle Knots he drops. <laughs> so now, now that Pierre's clock is sl somewhat lessened, it's a little bit more enticing to, to play Niblis of Frost. But with staring down a Dynavolt Tower, while well, that Niblis is, is just a little bit riskier, because Dynavolt Tower can't actually take it out. All right, so we're going to see a scry two from this Glimmer of Genius, a new addition from Kaladish. Deciding whether or not he wants this. He actually likes both of them. He decides to keep them. And Another was a land. And, and Pierre is in a pretty good position. When you're scrying lands to the top and feeling good about it, then th you know that's where your control deck wants to be. It <laughs> looks like a Sanctum of Ugin for Oliver, but no way to trigger it yet. And, and Oliver can get back that Colossus that got countered earlier, but... To do so, he'd have to sacrifice two artifacts, and uh, that, that, that's just not going to put him in a great spot. On the other hand, his Inventor's Fair mm -hmm. is, is finally paying dividends. All right, so uh, this will be the way to trigger that Sanctum now. Metal Colossus and a goodbye Inventor's Fair. All right, so in comes the Colossus, triggering the Sanctum, sacrificing it. Dynavolt Tower putting in some work here, making Colossus cheaper. So the fact that <laughs> Oliver was able to steal an artifact is very relevant here. And Pierre might be in trouble, because now we've seen... All of a sudden, Oliver went from zero power and toughness to the board to 2020 of power and toughness, assuming these both resolve. Yeah, this was a very big turn for Oliver. <laughs> Working hard to keep track of all that energy. So then comes Colossus number two, and this one gets a stick. So one of the two Colossi hit the board. Oliver was able to... Well, he played Sanctum of Ugin this turn, so he probably can't play that Inventor's Fair. We're having, we're having someone check into that. Cultivator's Caravan, on the other hand. Colossus is happy to drive it. <laughs> I call shenanigans on that. There's no way the Colossus fits in there. Well, it doesn't have to fit inside it. I think it can also crew the vehicle, you know, like when you're playing with a Hot Wheel and you're just, like, <laughs> you just gr grab the car and you send it over towards say, so your just opponent. just chucking it? <laughs> Well, if you throw it, you'll damage the Cultivator's Caravan. So I, I, th I, think, I think the Colossus just gently rolls it over towards Pierre. All right, all right. I, I buy the Hot Wheels approach. <laughs> all right, so it looks like the judges are uh, taking care of the potentially the extra land that might have been played. We'll get it sorted out in short order. The, the fair has the been delayed by a turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the Colossus does crew the Caravan, and... Uh, Pierre is, well, he's under a good amount of pressure. This is this is where Niblis of Frost get, could potentially shine. All right, so we're going to see an island from Pierre. Considering his options, he has a Niblis of Frost, Hardness Lightning, Tormenting Voice, and Glimmer of Genius. And so... Pierre's got a kind of intricate dance he has to do here uh, while remaining seated. Uh, he's, he has to play Niblis of Frost. And if he wanted to survive the Dynavolt Tower that Oliver stole, he needs to always keep an instant up to trigger prowess. That's going to be pretty difficult if he wants to also be casting spells in order to tap down Colossus. So I think, I think Pierre may have a, you know, a difficult game ahead of him here. He certainly has a lot of options. And Harness Lightning is a powerful card in this instance because he already has 13 energy. So Harness Lightning could actually take out a Colossus, but dealing with that Dynavolt Tower is going to be interesting.
Yeah, so the Dynamo Tower attempting to kill that Nibulus. Well, the, it, that actually works out, I think, fairly well for Pierre, because... <laughs> the other one, yes. All right, so Hardness Lightning will trigger Prowess on this Nibulus. I've not seen Harness Lightning kill a uh, Metalwork Colossus yet, but I think that's what we're about to see. <laughs> so much energy. There you go. Yep. Hardness Lightning taking care of that Colossus. This is crazy. The fact that that kills Colossus and saves Nibbles of Frost, that, that's really big for Pierre because, yes, Oliver has you know now three Colossus in his graveyard. He can start getting them back, but... The Colossus gets more and more expensive the more artifacts you sacrifice to get it back. <laughs> Oliver just can't <laughs> believe what just happened. It's because it's crazy. A lot of times you see something like Hardness Lightning because you're used to having a deal like about three damage to a creature, but he just has so much energy he can spend on this. It actually manages to take down the Colossus. Also note that uh, Oliver's on one energy. He can sack Woodweaver's Pulse and go up to four energy, but well, Dynamo Tower takes five, so that, that Nibbles is going to survive. Oliver actually needed to draw Sylvan Scrying to trigger Dynamo Tower, which is... Probably not what he expected to happen during the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the Inventor's Fairy is coming down this turn. And oh, he is going to be sacrificing two artifacts to get that Colossus back. It actually looks like Pierre was at 13 energy. Dynavolt Tower put him to 15. He spent 10 going down to 5. I don't think he actually got the 3 energy off Harness Lightning. All right, so it looks like the Colossus got in the caravan, and uh, in comes the caravan once more. This drops Pierre down a ton. All right, Tormenting Voice is going to tap down that Colossus. Let's see what he finds at the top. Oh, wow. Anticipate and Fiery Temper. All, all Pierre wants to find is instance, and uh, in this instance, he's able to find multiple copies. So I think Nibbles, you know, every time we just watch Pierre play, he's just winning games with Nibbles of Pro. Yes. I don't think they actually should be in the main deck because everyone plays all the removal in the main deck, but... Oh, it just They've seems been, to be like the absolutely best yeah, card they, in the in the matchups that it's needed. They've overperformed out of board. Uh, Nibbles, Nibbles of Frost has seemed excellent. The fact that Pierre has four in a sideboard, I think, is a testament to, to good preparation for the tournament. It's just such a good sideboard plan. Hand that is a Handward sure. Battlements coming down. Sure. Carlos Romao, I'm getting an update that Carlos Romao has defeated one Benjamin second. White's uh, two games to one. Pierre playing at blazing speed. Now, Pierre actually has all the cards, like literally and figuratively. Pierre now has gotten to the point where each of his card draw spells draws him more card draw spells. His Nibbles of Frost is just triggering all over the place. Oliver's got this one lone Colossus that just is covered in ice, can't even move. <laughs> and one energy staring down, staring down a, a Nibbles with a deadlock trap. I, I think this game is getting very, very close to Pierre just locking Oliver out. Last update from one of our back tables, uh, Reed Duke defeats Kenji Samura two games to one. Yes. All right, looks like uh, Reed was able to, to manage to take game three there. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Torrential, torrential Gear Hulk yep. coming down. Let's see uh, what Pierre wants to flash back. It looks like a Glimmer of Genius. Triggers the Nibbles, triggers a tower. <laughs> Are you good? Oliver's like, not not really. I'm not really cool with anything that's happening here, but, <laughs> but this is all according to game rules, so I'll allow it. Sorry, not that The This. Your energy is wrong. So they, they've so they are counting the energy. You were right about 13, that. It's happened a couple turns ago now, though. It did. I can say five. I think they said you use more than one bit. That's true. That's two bit, but I, I, it's a misplay, but it's fine, right? I, I, I like Pierre's line here. Yeah. He's just saying, I overspent on the hardest light. Yeah. yeah. I mean, technically, if he wants to overspend, it's well within his right. Yeah, he, Pierre, Pierre is not too worried about this, though. That yeah. Glimmer of Genius wants to be exiled off the Gear Hulk. Yeah. Pierre's got a lot of stuff going on. It's all happening very quickly, but uh, <laughs> I, I think he's in good shape here. Yeah, so that will continue to tap down the middle with Colossus. And with a grip full of, of cards. 
looking to close out this game. Two more mana. Trigger, trigger, sleep, sleep. Another yeah. take inventory. Oh. Trigger the tower. Trigger the Nibilis. Uh, I have one. I have two. Three. three. So. Is it weird that you continue to take inventory and every time you take inventory there's just more stuff? <laughs> yeah. That's not usually how it works. Usually when you take inventory, you're reducing the amount, but... Combat for it. Yeah, so at the beginning of combat, Deadlock Trap is going to tap down the Hulk, but the Nibblist does manage to sneak in. Oliver can't even sacrifice Inventor's Fair. Oh, he, he actually has... No, he has a third artifact locked down in the corner, so he could sacrifice Inventor's Fair. Sure. Looks like that's what he's going to do. Let's see what he can tutor up, because another Colossus is just not going to do it here. I don't think Sky Sovereign is going to get it, do it here either. How many cards do you have? Eight. Oh, <laughs> well, he has eight cards in hand. Yeah, so Oliver's deciding here if he wants to do anything before uh, cleanup. When Pierre's deck gets rolling, it lo just looks awesome. Uh, we see Sky Sovereign actually the bottom card there, the flagship itself. Uh, once once Pierre's deck starts getting rolling, it's just very sweet to see. Can Oliver sneak out a win here? Does he have, if he has red mana and enough mana to cast Colossus, Ceremonious Rejection, Avoid Shatter, give Colossus haste, attack for 11, or attack for 10 rather, that could potentially do it, but I think Pierre has another instant in his hand. I believe he's got a Harness Lightning. I mean, and he has seven cards in hand. <laughs> yeah. I'd be very surprised if he doesn't have an instant. Yeah, and any instant really will stop uh, Oliver from attacking with the, the, the new Colossus, even with haste. All right, Oliver, this is a big turn. Let's see what he can do. So it's a Metal or Colossus. That is going to meet a Void Shatter. That triggers a Nibilus and also triggers a Tower. <laughs> He's looking for the 14 on the Sorry, it's too complex for me. This game is hard. <laughs> it's it, it is hard. It's so much energy too. Oh yeah, Pierre, Pierre ha, Pierre's deck. There's has a got, lot going on yeah, here. Yeah, he's got a lot going on. So Oliver's gonna pass it back to Pierre. Trigger, sleeps, trigger. Anticipates gonna trigger and continue yes. to tap more things down. Gets to see more cards off the top. And the cards keep flowing for Pierre. Shoot you with a tower. Oliver doesn't even have any energy to use Deadlock Trap. If you look at him, he doesn't have very much energy just at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, Torrential Gear Hulk and uh, Nibbles of Frost are likely to close out this game. Yeah, the writing's on the wall for this one, it seems. And the second tower. Oliver still considering what he wants to do. He does. Oh, look at that. He has an Elder Deep Fiend. Sacrificing, or emerging, actually, from the first Colossus. Trying to tap down some lands. All right, so that, that will buy Oliver a turn here, except... You're at eight, right? I'm at six. Oh. Oliver's actually no, at six. He's double actually Dynavolt at tower. six, so Dynavolt Tower and Fiery Temper, yeah, and that'll do it. Yeah, the tower's saying and the... No, you gave two. Pierre Dagen takes the match, and this puts him to a 10 and 3. All right, he's, if he wins his next two rounds, he's got a, an opportunity to potentially draw in and potentially might have to win three in a row, but either way, he's still very live. You're totally right about that, Luis. Every time we see the, the blue red spells deck, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Nibbles of Frost has just won Pierre every post board game. Yeah, we have a lot more magic coming your way, but first, let's see what Rich has for us over at the news desk. Thanks very much to Gabby Sparts and Louis Scott Vargas down there in the feature match area, right by it, uh, with the story of round 13. So, by my reckoning, Pierre Dajon moves to 10 and 3. That keeps him very much alive in the quest for the top eight. Remember, the fourth loss, we believe, is pretty much fatal. Now, someone who's right betwixt and between that is Carlos Ramau of Brazil, because he's 9, 3, and 1. So, if he wins his next three, well, what happens then? 12, 3, and 1, is that going to be enough? We're pretty sure 12 and 4 isn't, and we suspect that 13 and 3 is. What about that 
halfway mark, if you like, with the draw for Carlos Romeu. Well, that match that's just finished featured Pierre Dajon of France looking to get back to a Pro Tour final, as he did at Pro Tour Theros in Dublin in 2013. He's on the floor of the feature match area, and he's with our own Brian David Marshall. Thanks, Rich. I'm here with Pierre Dajon. Pierre, uh, I know it, it showed uh, four losses on the screen there, but you actually are still uh, very much alive here at X and 3. Uh, yeah, I'm alive. Very much. I don't know, but I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not very much. So, so what are you thinking about as you head into these last three rounds of standard? I'm thinking I would like to win. Uh, my deck is pretty good, but matchups are getting tougher because uh, the Marvel deck is not very easy to beat. Uh, meaning it's very hard. Uh, and also it's kind of bittersweet because I just beat Oliver and he's a former teammate and slash still a teammate, a good friend. And like, I would rather eliminate someone else. But obviously I'm still happy. <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Now, uh, tell me about that last game. What was going on there? Tell me how, how that, uh, what was going through your mind as you played out those final turns and tried to figure out how, how to finish off uh, this bittersweet win. Yeah, it was kind of tough because I have two towers, which is not the way the matchup is supposed to go. Like, I, I left a few towers because I need to kill him one way or another, but it's not very efficient in the matchup. Like, he doesn't kill Colossus. So I had to fold a game plan, which is not like the initial game plan, which is that just untap with Nemilis and win. So I tried to, f I knew he has coup, a confiscation coup passport, so I tried to engineer a game where he's going to have to take one of my towers, then I can play a Nemilis, and then he I think kind of missed something because I played Manibalis. I had mana up. He tried to kill it with my own tower, which is not very nice, by the way, Oliver. And I could play a spell in response. And thanks to a prowess trigger, I keep my Nibilis. And from that point, it was pretty easy because Nibilis handles all of his deck if I have it on my board. I just need to protect my Nibilis. And then it was just a matter of killing him fast enough so that uh, he cannot like go to time uh, because his deck gains a lot of life. And my deck is pretty slow to kill, but the gear hulk helps a lot in that regard. So the, uh, the sideboard Nibbles to Frost, this has been your MVP card all weekend? I don't think I lost a game where I cast it so far. It's been insane. Uh, it, I don't know how well it will be go for the card in the future because people will learn how to respect it. But right now it's been insane. It's been winning me more than half of my matches. So after the, in the middle of the game having the two towers show up, it was the return of the king, and you were able to uh, complete the story here. You got three more rounds to go. Much like Tolkien, there's still many more chapters <laughs> left before we actually get to the end here for Pierre Dejean, uh sending it back to the news desk in Rich Hagon in the meanwhile. Thanks very much, BDM, and thanks to Pierre Dajon, one of the true good guys in world magic. Very talented and a really lovely human being as well. Uh, now, who else is in the mix? Rich Hone is 10-2-1. Matt Nass up to 11-2. He's been setting the pace all day. Elias Watzfeldt of Sweden still in there at 10-3. So is Lee Shi Chan. Uh, so uh, Asia Pacific well represented as we head down the stretch. Makis Matsukas, though, he is at 12 and 1. Having defeated Shoti Yasuoka, Matsukas leads the Pro Tour with three rounds to go. Now, one more win pretty sure that gets him in. This is the kind of place at a smaller Pro Tour he'd start thinking about draws, but that is not going to be the case. And remember, the one and two seed advance directly to the semi-finals tomorrow. The three and four seed, they will advance to the second stage of quarter-final action. Seeds five through eight, they come in and have to play four matches on Sunday if they want to win the whole thing. So seeding is going to be crucial as we head down the stretch. Expect to see everyone playing every round here in the closing rounds of Pro Tour Kaladesh. But it is deck tech time and Steve Rubin, Pro Tour champion, uh, is still in the mix at 10 and 3. And Rubin, Ben Rubin, was famous for playing a zoo deck. Well, there's another zoo deck waiting for us across the studio. Ian Duke is with Frank Carsten. <laughs> 